The frigid winter of 1778 was the most uncertain of times for a nation vying for its independence. The British Empire was entering its fourth year of trying to quell the uprising of the American colonies. General William Howe had captured the rebel capital of Philadelphia, forcing its Congress to flee into the countryside, but at the price of 6,000 royal soldiers captured near Saratoga, New York. In response, Howe is relieved of command. His replacement? Lieutenant General Henry Clinton. At 48 years of age, the native Newfoundlander had many military stints across the world, including a commission in the New York militia. Thanks to connections, his colonial nature was set aside, allowing him to gain a seat on Parliament in 1772. His wife passed away that same year, followed by his eldest son two years thereafter. The rebellion in the colonies allowed him to escape his grief, making landfall in Boston in 1775. Now he found himself with the most powerful British position in America, standing in the capital of the rebellion, and now he would have to make an unpopular move. On February 6, 1778, the Treaty of Alliances was signed between France and the United States. Unofficially, France had declared a war upon its greatest rival yet again. For Clinton, it meant that Philadelphia could be blocked from the Atlantic by a French Navy. Clinton decided to avoid such a calamity and prepared for the evacuation of Philadelphia and returned to bolster the defenses of New York City. As for General George Washington, the news was one of a thousand things running through his mind. Failure to protect and recapture Philadelphia led to several officers and congressmen to conspire to have Washington replaced by Saratoga's victor, Horatio Gates. Known as the Conway Cabal, its plans were quickly brought down by Washington's most loyal men, among them being the revolutionary devoted Marquis de Lafayette, abolitionist-minded John Lawrence, and quill-powered Alexander Hamilton. The Cabal made it all the more clear of how badly in need the Continental Army needed to be overhauled. Enter Frederick Wilhelm von Steuben, whose adaptation of the Prussian military rulebook to the American way of fighting prepared the Continental Army to be ready to retake Philadelphia. Even with these reforms, critics abound. In April of that year, Major General Charles Lee returned to the Continental Army after a year as prisoner. The 46-year-old was cut from English cloth, but following his services for the British Crown in North America during the Seven Years' War, he grew fond of the freedoms one had in living within the colonies. His impressive length of service, he hoped, would garner him the commanding rank he so coveted. Unable to receive it with the British, he sides with the Patriot cause, but has one major flaw. His horrible temper has made him unpopular throughout his service. At one time, wrong and a surgeon who in return tried to kill the general. His outspoken nature garnered him the Mohawk name Onawatarika, boiling water. In fact, Lee was captured in 1776 as a consequence for delaying at a tavern just to write a correspondence condemning Washington's leadership following the loss of New York City. And upon his return to command in May of 1778, felt the cause of the revolution was lost. Even with Steuben's improvements, Lee had no faith that Washington could win a battle to retake the capital. There would be no battle. After delaying to hear word of a peace offer that was flatly rejected, Clinton hastily moved some 20,000 British soldiers and loyalist refugees to the New Jersey side of the Delaware, clearing out Philadelphia by the 18th of June. The ball was now in the American court. Washington wishes to pounce upon the British column, but his staff is split. The majority of the foreign officers, including Lee and Steuben, oppose such a bold action. Lee argues the war is now in the hands of the French. It is ironic then that Lafayette is among the party of officers adamant for action. Washington makes a compromise. He entrusts William Maxwell's New Jersey Brigade, as well as multiple companies of militia, to harass the British baggage train, while the main column would shadow the routes of evacuation. In the early morning of the 18th, the Continental Army departed Valley Forge and crosses the Schuylkill River. Both armies become bogged down in their initial advance by a combination of stifling days and rainy nights. By the 22nd, Clinton had only managed to make it to Mount Holly. To quicken his march, Clinton would split his force upon two roads. The 1st Division cuts north upon the road toward Allentown, commanded by one of the very few in Parliament that voted against the Stamp Act, Lieutenant General Cornwallis. 
but his sympathies for the colonists were long gone. He had been the one to let the Continental Army slip across the Delaware in 1776. Now he found himself being the prey, having his advance screened by Alexander Leslie's brigade, who skirmished with Dickinson's militia at Crosswick's Creek and Bordentown. Meanwhile, Lieutenant General Nafishin's division consisted mainly of the baggage train and proceeded unmolested toward the crossroads at Imlestown. By the 24th, both opposing commanders had to make yet another decision. For both, New Jersey provided little in morale advantage, as loyalists and patriots were evenly split across the landscape. To head north by land would mean crossing several rivers over land ill-fitting for foraging for an army rapidly dwindling in supplies. Instead, Clinton will move to the point of Sandy Hook and await to be ferried by sea back to New York City. Concurrently, Washington saw an opportunity. If he could make a quick strike against the British column, he may be able to pull off his own Saratoga, capturing or at least destroying a portion of Clinton's army. But once again, Lee and several other officers opposed the bold strategy. Once more, Lafayette and several others argue in favor of a full-on attack. Yet again, Washington must compromise. He will send a detachment of picked riflemen under the command of Daniel Morgan to aid Maxwell and Dickinson's harassment of Clinton's column. From Rocky Hill, Washington then detaches approximately 5,000 men and intends to have Lafayette strike the British column. Lee, however, convinces the commanding general to give himself leadership of the detachment. After all, Lee was second in command of the entire army and outranked the young Lafayette. Washington agrees, but very quickly Lee finds himself surrounded by officers who he knows little about. As Lee advances east, Nafenshin's men encamp in the vicinity of Freehold, otherwise known as Monmouth Courthouse. Aside from the county's judicial hall, most of the community was sparsely populated and consisted of several farms, perfect for foraging. By June 27th, the rest of the army had joined, while Lee was within a few miles west in Englishtown. Washington rode ahead to reinforce his desire for Lee to strike, but Lee soon claimed to his subordinates he had no proper intelligence to indicate such an action could occur. The stage was now set for the longest single-day clash of the American Revolution. June 28, 1778 opened with a sweltering dawn. Clinton had hoped to beat the heat and made preparations for his army to move out of Monmouth and to begin the 20-mile march north toward Middletown. Philemon Dickinson had encamped his militiamen just three and a half miles west from town upon the grounds of the Tenet Presbyterian Meeting House. From here, around 4.30 a.m., he sends word to Lee that the British are preparing to move. Lee began to organize his division, but delays in acquiring the proper scouts and organizing his brigades meant that he did not get moving until 7.30. By that time, von Steuben and a group of officers, including Lawrence, had rode as close as they could to the British line, hoping to determine the best approach of attack. Instead, they found themselves spotted by British dragoons. These were the 400 men of the Queen's Rangers, a skilled team of light infantry that were the brainchild of the famed Robert Rogers, now commanded by John Gray Simcoe. Simcoe had been seeking the former regiment of freed black men from Boston, but had now garnered infamy for using the Rangers as a lethal weapon. Most recently, with the night raid upon a home quartering Patriot militia, killing ten of them with the bayonet. Simcoe quickly moves in hot pursuit upon Steuben, sensing a chance to bag some of the Patriots' most elite officers, but gets stopped along the Englishtown Road by Dickinson's militia, who pour several volleys into the oncoming horses. The Rangers retreat back to town. Lee arrived at the meeting house around 8 a.m. with the latest orders from Washington. Bring on an engagement or attack as soon as possible unless some very powerful circumstances forbid it. But when Lee meets with his officers, he finds conflicting accounts filled with hesitation. Dickinson notes that the lone bridge across the Spotswood Brook could be easily turned into a choke point, and that scouts indicate the presence of British forces on either side of the road awaiting to ambush. Lee merged together William Grayson's Virginians, Richard Butler's Pick Battalion, and Henry Jackson's additional regiments to form an ad hoc unit for Brigadier General Mad Anthony Wayne to command. While Wayne cautiously advanced, Lee dispatched parties to investigate the farms, dispelling fears of any attack, delaying Lee's movements yet again. 
By 9.30, Wayne and Lee are on the outskirts of Monmouth Courthouse, finding only what they believe were only a few hundred light infantry composing of the rear guard. Butler and Jackson found Simcoe's Queen Ranger standing guard in an orchard north of the courthouse, opening fire, quickly driving the Rangers back toward the road. However, the Massachusetts and Pennsylvanians had to scurry for cover in the woods as a British free pounder had begun firing upon the orchard. Seeing the enemy with his own eyes, Lee devises a plan. He sends orders to Wayne to pursue the British rear guard and pull them into battle. Lafayette will move through town and smash into the British flank. Ideally, this will trap the British light infantry and force them to surrender. Unfortunately for Lee, Clinton was commanding this rear guard and has sent word to Cornwallis to return to Monmouth with his division. Wayne leads his picked men across the middle brook. Being in the trees provided little in the way of relief from the heat, as even in the shade it was presently 80 degrees and climbing. Wayne also had to delay his attack, as Jackson's men had already exhausted their 12 rounds of ammunition, the amount issued for police in the streets of Philadelphia a few weeks prior. While Jackson and Butler paused in the trees, they were covered by a detachment of militia light horses. Clinton ordered an attack, sending the 16 Queen's Light Dragoons in a charge across the orchards of William Wyckoff Sr. But as the light horses disperse, Butler and Jackson open a deadly volley to drop several of the riders. Wayne's whole unit now emerged from the woods, along with Varnum's Brigade of Connecticut and Rhode Island men, commanded at the time by Colonel John Durkee. A battery of two guns were established opposite the Wyckoff's Orchard, manned by David Cook and observed by Englishman Lieutenant Colonel Eliza Oswald, Lee's senior artillery advisor. Meanwhile, Clinton regrouped his small rear guard to straddle the road junction, his center anchored by a battalion of light infantry picked from various regiments in Clinton's army. As Lee oversaw the rest of his division move into battle, he could see a cloud of dust rising from the north. Shortly thereafter, a long line of red began to rise upon the horizon. The lead elements of Cornwallis' division had countermarched right into the left flank of the Americans. The front lines comprised of two brigades commanded by Charles Gray. The general was known infamously as No Flint Gray for ordering his men to discard their flint in exchange for bayonets when storming an American encampment near Anthony Wayne's estate in Poly, PA. In reality, Gray had only made the order to avoid a misfire, but the name stuck. Once more in history, Wayne had been caught off guard by Gray. The ad hoc American brigades began to buckle. Meanwhile, Lafayette had reached the field, only to come face to face with multiple lines of grenadiers. In fright, the free battalions fanned out. The Pennsylvanians, commanded by the dashing 22-year-old Scotsman Walter Stewart, hurried up to an intersection outlying the Wyckoff Farm, while Colonels James Weston and Henry Livingston covered the flanks. At 600 yards, the Sioux sides opened fire. Artillery hammered Lafayette's line gravy wounding Weston and disintegrating the line. In chaos, former Maryland delegate Nathaniel Ramsey took charge of Weston's detachment. The British artillery also managed to cripple one of Oswald's guns. With the sun roasting the artillery crew, who were down to just one gun, Oswald gave orders for Cook's battery to retreat. Seeing the guns leaving the field, as well as part of Wayne's command moving west through the woods, Maxwell and Stewart assumed the general retreat had been called. Three regiments of ours that had advanced to a plain open country towards the enemy's left flank were ordered by General Lee to retreat and occupy the village of Monmouth. They were no sooner formed there than they were ordered to quit their posts and gain the woods behind them. One order succeeded another and a repudy and indecision calculated to ruin us. Hoping to delay the British advance, Oswald had erected all ten of his guns on the curve farm west of town. Some of Lafayette's men briefly regrouped on the English Town Road, getting off a few volleys to try and buy a few extra minutes before rejoining the withdrawal. Seeing the whole of Cornwallis' division coming near, Lafayette rode up to Oswald and ordered him to pull to safety to the heights farther west. It was now past 12 o'clock, and the sun blistered upon the New Jersey farms. Temperatures estimated to be spiking anywhere just shy of 100 degrees. The humidity only doubled the misery of the Americans streaming up the Englishtown Road. Washington arrived to find staggers stumbling past the meeting house. When the first soldier told him of Lee's decision to withdraw, he had the man arrested to avoid spreading further panic. Many years later, Private John Ackerman of the 1st New Jersey would record, our regiment was ordered to retreat, which was effected by passing through a morass in which I lost my shoes. 
After retreating through this morass, my regiment came to the road just as the troops under the immediate command of General Washington were passing. General Washington halted and were immediately paraded. Having become disordered and retreating through the morass, I well recollect that General Washington asked the troops if they could fight, and they answered him with free cheers. Washington at last found Lee near the farm of William Woodcuff Jr. Accounts vary of what followed, but it is certain that Washington was never more volatile than on this day. Attempts to defend the decision with improper intelligence and circumstances that out of control fell on deaf ears. Furiously, Washington denounced Lee, insulted that he would take command of a fight he never wished to partake in. Lee quietly departed to the rear while Washington went into action. From where he sat, Washington could hear fighting to the north as Charles Scott's picked detachment held out against Gray's brigade. To his front, Washington could make out the glint of the musket barrels of a British attack formation moving past the courthouse. The tables were now turned. Clinton was now the one on the offensive. He sent his grenadiers and guards to pursue Lee's men. Among those ranks was Lieutenant Colonel Henry Moncton, commander of the 2nd Grenadier Battalion. He had entered the military to stamp his own legacy with one of Britain's most prestigious names. His father had a seat in the House of Commons. His half-brother was a general officer. His other brother sat on fortunes accumulated from the eastern trade routes, and his only sister was an up-and-coming literary hostess. Henry, however, was aiming to gain his reputation by being a gallant man on the field of battle. The previous fall, he had demonstrated the speed of his battalion, making them the best grenadiers in all of North America. Now he was just 15 minutes away from routing the fleeing rebels. Washington met with Lafayette and his other officers and quickly formed a plan. He needed just enough of a delay to get the main body of the Continental Army positioned on the hills which the meeting house sat on. From there, American artillery could cut any advancing column to shreds. He entrusted Stuart and Ramsey to be the obstacle Washington needed. They set out to hide within the thickets concealing a road intersection, known later as the Point of Woods. Trying to correct the retreat, Lee began to rally as many of his men that he could find. Backed by four of Oswald's guns, Livingston and Durkee were convinced into lining up behind a hedgerow that divided the Wyckoff Jr. farm from the meeting house's parsonage. Now, the British would have to advance under frontal and enfilading fire. Unfortunately for Lee, Jackson ignored his demands and continued back to the meeting house, and Colonel Matthias Ogden, who would go no farther than defending the bridge, unwilling to sacrifice his 1st New Jersey regiment. It was now nearing 1 o'clock, as nearly 2,000 grenadiers and guardsmen appeared on the edge of the Wickup Jr. farm, their advance bisected by a wooden fence. A flurry of musket balls let loose into the column of red. Forty men fell at once. Upon seeing their colonel included in the wounded, the first foot guard veered violently into the woods headlong, being joined by the rest of the column. In just a few minutes, dozens would be killed, wounded, or captured in the dense woods. Stuart fell with a shot through the groin. Soldiers of his disintegrating detachment carried him to the rear. Ramsey soon found himself alone, his command also crushing under the pressure of the foot guards. The Americans retreated into a clearing west of the woods as a cluster of dragoons raced into the clearing and cut Ramsey from the rest of his men, and after sparring with one of the dragoons, disappeared in the tall grass with a shot to the cheek. As they emerged from the point of woods, the Redcoats came under fire from two guns positioned across the field. Lieutenant William Hale of the 2nd Grenadier Battalion remembered what happened next. General Clinton himself appeared at the end of our left wing, accompanied by Lord Cornwallis and crying out, charge, grenadiers, never heed for me. We rushed on amidst the heaviest fire I have yet felt. It was no longer a contest for bringing up our respective companies in the best order, but all officers as well as soldiers strove who could be foremost to my shame I speak. Noticing the American right flank was left unprotected, the 16th Dragoons charged forward, only to be shunned away by American marksmanship. As the foot guards moved up the English Town Road, Moncton led his Grenadier Battalion straight forward toward the hedgerow. They stormed into a hell of musketry at just 20 yards, grape shot tattering their ranks. Hand to hand combat sprouted along the line. At least one man's body would later be recovered with a puncture wound of a sword. In the hail of gunfire, Moncton had reinvigorated his men through the chaos, but silenced by a piece of grape shot through his heart. Lawrence and Hamilton rode into the fray, trying to keep the hedgerow from falling. Both of their horses were shot away, the officers being swamped with Americans dispersing past them. Some of the bloodiest fight in the American Revolution had just elapsed in 15 minutes, but it was long enough for Lord Sterling's Wayne of the Continental Army to arrive on the field. Along with them were 12 guns of Henry Knox's artillery. 
the battery was predominantly outfitted with the six pound field piece. The poor course of the American artillery, these French made guns were far more lightweight than the older British artillery pieces captured earlier in the war, quickly were deployed on the hillside known as Perrin Ridge. They no sooner were at the ready when the 2nd Grenadiers charged over the Middle Brook Bridge. Concurrently, the 42nd Highlanders, famed as the Black Watch, were moving through the orchard owned by the Sutton family. Case shot poured into the ranks on the oncoming Redcoats, forcing the Black Watch to freeze and the 2nd Grenadiers retreat back across the brook. From the hedgerow, Clinton can now see some 14,000 Americans forming upon the ridge ahead. A frontal assault could not be made without heavy losses. Clinton now called upon an amalgamation of 10 guns of various calibers to be established at in the opening east of the parsonage to counter the American artillery. Starting at 1.30, the roar of cannon and dinging of their rounds hitting the earth echoed across the New Jersey landscape. From this artillery duel emerged one of the enduring legends of the War of Independence. Somewhere along the line of guns, a woman running water to soldiers fatigued by the boiling atmosphere dropped her bucket and took up utensils from man in a cannon. Only one first-hand account exists, describing the a circumstance of the woman's petticoat being tattered by a stray cannonball. Most likely, this was Mary Ludwig Hayes, whose husband was an artilleryman who had fallen fatigued by the heat of the day. History would label her as Molly Pitcher. While the Great Cannonade generated folklore, it did little in the way of harm to either army's position. With two-thirds of a mile to cover, debilitating humidity and parent judgment, most cannonballs were harmlessly passing overhead. By 2 p.m., Clinton shifts his focus upon the American left, which seemingly ended abruptly near the meeting house. The rear guard was reorganized under the helm of the General Quartermaster William Erskine, who took them on a march across the North Brook and through the farm of the Deacon John Craig overlooking the battlefield. The light infantry and the Queen Rangers then moved into the cover of trees in an attempt to swing down upon the meeting house. Washington, however, had anticipated this move. He called upon Lafayette to extend the left flank on the wooded hillside with Marylanders, North Carolinians, and a regiment out of Delaware. As the Rangers neared the meeting house, New Jersey militiamen hurried to plug the gap. Not wanting to be entangled, Erskine or Simcoe ordered a retreat back behind the British lines. In the process, a British cannon became bogged down in the muddy bends of the North Brook. Dickinson rushed forward, his militia trying to seize the gun. Simcoe viciously led a counterattack. Loyalists and patriots struggled in a brief but violent scuffle. Eventually, the Rangers pulled the cannon free from the mud and regrouped with Gray's men around the Sutton farm. When the battle began, Clinton had neglected to take the high ground of Coombs Hill, which was to his south, due to being surrounded by wetlands. But Washington was made well aware of the heights by a member of staff who lived on the battlefield. Washington advised Green to take the hill. Green moved to position with four guns under the command of French Lieutenant Colonel Duplessis. At 3 p.m., the order was given to fire. While Knox's guns were doing little, Plessis' battery quickly began to batter the left flank of the British line. Clinton quickly realized his position was compromised. Any further offensive moves were of no work. He began to make preparations for a general withdrawal. Seeing the British shift their formations in preparation to retreat, Washington saw a chance to recover his men's morale. They had managed to solve their advance. Now he could instill the belief they had driven the British off the field. He called upon Scott's two remaining picked battalions, commanded by Richard Parker and Joseph Siley. Their target were the Highlanders still holding out within the Sutton Orchard. Being occupied with avoiding the rounds of American artillery, they failed to notice Parker and Siley moving through the shallow valley of the North Brook, only spotted when forced to break for cover from British artillery. The Highlanders tried to reform upon the northern fence of the orchard, but Parker set up a battery of two six-pounders. The Highlanders had no choice but to leave the shelter of the orchard, pulling back into a meadow east of the property. Here, they were supported by a three-pounder from the 1st Light Infantry. The Americans rushed into a hail of case shot before Siley ordered them back into the orchard, allowing Gray and Erskine to organize their brigades and to pull across the Middle Brook to safety. With the northern farm secured, Washington now turned to the south. Washington called upon Wayne to strike the remaining British off the field. He picked the 3rd Pennsylvania Regiment, along with additional regiments presently commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Rudolph Bunner of Pennsylvania, and the latter being commanded by the later-to-be-infamous Aaron Burr. 
As they emerged across the woods and into the blistering sun, they were rejuvenated when they saw the first battalion of grenadiers isolated from the rest of Clinton's retreat. Wayne ordered an aggressive push forward. On the Kerr farm, Lieutenant Colonel James Webster could see the situation unfolding in front of him and quickly took it upon himself to rescue the Grenadiers. He ordered the 33rd foot at the double quick across the South Brook and into the Whitcuff farm, just as Wayne opened up on the Grenadiers. Impervious to bullets and intolerable humidity, Webster's haste caught the Americans off guard. A quick succession of volleys tore them apart. Near the bloody hedgerow, Bunner was killed. The highest ranking Continental officer lost that day. Burr fled on foot with what remained of his shattered regiment to the safety of the buildings comprising of the parsonage. After ensuring Wayne could not counterattack, the British at last broke off the engagement roughly before six. Although Washington tried to organize some 700 men to pursue Clinton, the sight of many soldiers dropping for want of water made him reconsider. After nearly 12 hours of constant fighting and in inhumane blazing heat, the longest single day engagement of the American Revolution had at last come to an end. Sunday night into Monday would be dedicated to the ghastly task of collecting the dead and wounded, made only worse by the horrific teat those who had fallen had lay in. Of those first to arrive to tend to the casualties was Dr. William Reed, who had traveled as far away as Georgia to follow the Continental Army, along with his servant, Peter Houston. The two would stumble across a most horrifying find. I found an officer laying a few yards from a morass, nearly cut in two by a cannon shot. He was alive and spoke, imploring me to lift him to a tree which to stand near, alleging that he had been all night trying to do so, that he might die easy. The clotted blood was piled up several inches on his front and it had ceased to flow. With assistance from Houston, I assessed to lift him tenderly and stepping backwards, we placed him against the tree. The blood now began to flow precipitately and in all probability terminated his life. They heard him utter a few words of thankfulness and proceeded on. The British had left with no time to tend to their losses. Some 200 American soldiers, civilians, and slaves were pulled together to recover the fallen of both sides, bringing the wounded to the tenant meeting house, which had been converted into a hospital. But for many, amputations were needed to be done where they had fallen. Dr. Reed notes later of having to tear apart the clothes of the deceased to make bandages for the wounded. Most, however, were ill from heat exhaustion. Water was of the highest priority for a soldier who encamped that night on the Monmouth battlefield. In the days that followed, both sides would report highly exaggerated casualty figures inflicted on the enemy. Coupled with the fact the British never directly counted their losses, the final butcher's bill is conflicted. At present, the official record stands at 69 killed, 161 wounded, and 132 missing and captured from the Americans. The British suffered similarly, with 65 killed, 170 wounded, and 64 captured and missing. Little was gained in terms of losses. Although the British had destroyed the initial attack, Clinton's zeal of routing the remainder of the Connell army led to his forces being stonewalled at Perrin Ridge. Having conceded the field to the Americans, Washington chalked it up as good enough for a moral victory. Victory. Monmouth, however, did little in the way of affecting Clinton's evacuation. During the night, Clinton stealthily moved his men past Washington's pickets, continuing on his course to Middletown. By the 1st of July, Clinton had positioned his forces on the formidable heights of Navasick, protecting their cross into Sandy Hook. Washington did not entertain the idea of throwing his exhausted men against the heights. Having come out of the ordeal of Valley Forge and standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British was enough to satisfy the Patriots. They moved overland via New Brunswick and eventually were back at the winter quarters of Mortarstown. Washington and Clinton could not realize it at the time, but they would remain staring at each other for the next three years. A most hellish plan has been formed, and I may say at the least not discouraged by headquarters, to destroy my honor and reputation. I have demanded a court-martial, which has fortunately been granted, if I had been let alone, should I with patience have suffered him to pick up the laurels which I had shaken down and laid at their feet, but the outrageous attacks made are enough to drive patience itself to madness. I shall not trouble you at present with a detail of the action, but by all scared, General Washington has scarcely any more to do in this than strip the dead. 
These trials commenced on of all days, July 4th, 1778, with the charges of disobeying orders, conducting an unnecessary, disorderly, and shameful retreat and disrespect toward the commander-in-chief. While Lee initially had a stout defense based upon the fact his position was justifiably unattainable considering the numbers placed against him upon Cornwallis' arrival, it quickly turned into a personal conflict between the honor of Washington and himself, and that was a fight he was never going to win. When the court finished by August 9th, the board found Lee guilty of Washington sending the decision to Congress. On December 6, 1778, Congress served Lee with a one-year suspension for command. Outraged, Lee began a furious campaign to have his name cleared, openly insulting Washington at every turn. Maybe it's for lacking at Monmouth the boldness he was famous for that Lawrence challenged Lee to a duel over Washington's honor. On Christmas Eve 1778, the two met outside of Philadelphia. In the opening shot, Lawrence grazed his elder in the abdomen. When Lee definitely asked to go a second round, Lawrence in both seconds called for it to be over. Because of his wound, Lee was unable to accept Anthony Wayne's challenge to a duel. The Battle of Monmouth marked a change in the course of the American Revolution. Being bottled up in New York, Clinton turned his attention to the southern colonies. He sent General Cornwallis to Charleston, the city that both of them had failed to capture back in 1776. This time in 1780, they were decisively successful. Cornwallis then proceeded to destroy the reputation of the man whom some wished Washington to be replaced by, Horatio Gates. But the brutal war in the South backfired, reinforcing patriot sentiments. Daniel Morgan and Nathaniel Green would outwit Cornwallis. Low on supplies, the man who voted against the very tax that triggered this whole mess marched to a little poor town called Yorktown, where the French Navy cut off his retreat. The fear Clinton had that sparked the Monmouth campaign had at last come true. Cornwallis' army would be forced to surrender, and a few years after, America would gain its independence. <laughs>